Welcome to Behind the Page, the Eli Marks podcast with your hosts, John Gaspard and me, Jim Cunningham. Hey there, Jim. Hey, Chano. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. This is, uh, who knew, we're episode two, season two, episode two. It's it's one of those, uh, it's like... Uh, one of those number things it's the same backwards as forward season yeah, two exactly. episode it, two it, two i don't is it it's not a palindrome no it isn't yeah Some, it's a it's the numerical version of a palindrome yeah. but it's so much fun here here we are chapter two of the bullet catch i'm surprised we made it this far thrilled <laughs> with people who've, i'm thrilled with people who've talked to us and we've got return guests i mean who knew not only uh, would they do it once they'd do it twice uh it, and we've got steve cohen remember him from last season? Of course I do. Yeah, I'm a big fan of his. We both saw his show in New York, and I think he is a tremendous entertainer, and I enjoyed that show immensely. Yeah, his show uh, is fantastic uh, in New York. It has moved to different hotels since I think we saw it. But if, if you want to go to an intimate chamber show where, uh, at least in my experience, I believe everybody in that audience that night had something pretty magical happen to them. Yeah, I one agree. way or another. There's only 40 people allowed in the uh, in the show, but every single one of us had something uh, weird magically happen to us, and it was I, I really enjoyed the heck out of that show. And if you're headed to New York, uh, find Steve Cohen's uh, Chamber Magic show and uh, get yourself a ticket or two. Yeah, I went alone. You got in kind of special, didn't you? I did, yeah. I I email. I only have one night. I was there for a, a, a doing a, um, a corporate event, and then I had an audition for uh, something else in New York. And I had one night free, and it was sold out. So I emailed him and said, "Hey, uh, you know." And I didn't know I was talking to Steve Cohen. I emailed what I assume was the ticket people, mm-hmm. said, "Say, hey, I'm, I, you know, I'm in town for one night. I would love to see this show. Um, could I get on a waiting list, or are there cancellations occasionally?" Got an email right back. Said, "If you are you just one?" I said, "Yep, I just need one ticket." He said, I, "I've I've opened it up for you. Here's the link. Click on it." And come to behold, that uh, I was talking to Steve Cohen the whole time, and he opened up a seat, and I enjoyed it incredibly. It, it's everybody should see it. It's it's different than anything you've ever experienced magically. It's just uh, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, it was really fun, and it was great talking to him last year about Max Molini. He uh, has since put out a book about Max Molini. Uh, and this time he uh, was a perfect person to talk to about the title of uh, the second book in the Eli Mark series, The Bullet Catch, because he is one of uh, a handful of people who has performed The Bullet Catch and he has the scar to prove it. And of course, we've also both seen uh, Penn and Teller do The Bullet Catch. I don't think they refer, I don't think they call it that. I don't know but- what they call it, but it, it is absolutely terrifying in their hands. And uh uh, I think Steve talks a little bit about that in this interview. It is it is a trick that I want nothing to do with. It's yeah, it's that's sort of his his major theme uh, toward the end of the uh, conversation. But at the very start of it, uh, he did a great job of sort of giving us a quick history of the bullet catch. Right. So the bullet catch is actually been around for for a very uh, long time there the legend is that 13 people have died performing it and no one wants to become number 14 actually i take it back 12 people have died performing the bullet catch nobody wants to become number 13 but the fact is that that many people have been injured uh performing it including myself i ended up with a with a hematoma blood tumor um by getting hit by a piece of the glass shard uh when the bullet was fired through the glass at me I mean, the, the funny thing about the bullet catch is that it's, it, it is an illusion, right? Otherwise, magicians wouldn't be performing it. Um, but at the same time, there is a genuine level of danger involved. And so why would a magician purposely put themselves uh, at risk for the entertainment of an audience? It, it's really a kind of an odd and morose question that you have to contemplate. I didn't want to perform the bullet catch myself. But when I made my TV show for the History Channel called uh, Lost Magic Decoded, part of my contract was if you want to get the, the special, you have to be the one performing it. So in other words, I was hoping to farm that trick out to somebody else <laughs> and, let, and I would just be the narrator. 
But they said, nope, if you're the host of this show, if you want the show, if you want the contract, the two hour special, you have to be the one performing it. So I thought, well, I really want to be on TV. I really want this show to, to, uh, to come to fruition. So I guess I'll, I'll learn how to do the bullet catch. How hard can it be? Oh boy. Um, well, it turns out that was actually probably uh, a mistake and I'll never perform it again. Like Bill Kalush says in, in the interview on the TV show, he said, if you play with fire, you're going to get burned. And, you know, there's, this is a type of trick where one small slip can lead to death. And, you know, when I was leaving the house that morning to go to Brooklyn, I joked around to my kids and to my wife said, okay, well, this might be it. See, love, I love you guys. Hope. And they thought it was, you know, they were taking it very seriously. I was taking it very flippantly. I think that was my defense mechanism to deal with the fact that I knew that in the back of my head that there was danger involved, um, but I was trying to make light of it. And the fact that I ended up in the hospital after performing the bullet catch, maybe was was, you know, part of uh, fate. Maybe it was uh, it was meant to be after the way I was kind of just flipping it off. So I'll never forget standing there when the muzzle was actually flashing and. I saw one muzzle flash, but then I felt two moments where I was falling backwards. One when I was catching the bullet and one when I was hit in the chest. And I didn't understand why. I only saw one muzzle flash. Why was I, why was I falling down and, and, it, and, and having two moments of impact? And it really was because the glass that was meant to be a uh, proof that there was a projectile moving from point A to point B had shattered. It was a tempered glass, and the pr the point of the glass is to prove that there was you know, actually a projectile. It wasn't just a, a, a cap gun. And so when I fell backwards, I started cursing like a sailor. <laughs> and my director was wondering why was this guy cursing? You know, this would be footage we can't use. And there was my way of signaling to him something went wrong, and that's exactly what Chung Ling Su. William Robinson actually said aloud when he got killed performing this very trick on stage, he yelled out, something's gone wrong, lower the curtain, uh, which is ironic because he was apparently a Chinese man who didn't speak a word of English. Suddenly he was speaking with a Brooklyn accent in English on stage, lower the curtain, something's gone wrong. You know, that's, that's how I felt at the moment. I had to signal to the director, something has gone wrong. They had an EMT on hand ready and it was really, the EMT was meant to just be there for a show, but we never even thought he would he would ever ever get involved in this. But suddenly he was cutting open my shirt. You know, my my face was fine. Of course, I was able to spit out the signed bullet, but I had this nerve damage that was done on my chest. Like you know, this is years ago. I still feel the spot where I have no sensation in my chest. Oh my god! Uh, where the piece of tempered glass flew straight at me, and um, fortunately it grazed my skin. It didn't enter me but uh, it went straight underneath my armpit. And you know, I had no protective gear on other than a pair of goggles to protect my eyes. So some people then wrote in and there were, you know, people write in all these crazy comments and I got nasty emails from people saying, oh, that was a fake bullet, it dissolves on impact. And that was just a makeup job you had done. And you no, know, like you know, I couldn't walk up and down stairs for weeks without a great amount of pain as my chest would Kind of you know bounce as you're walking up and down the stairs it was it really affected my life uh, and we never thought that anyone would get injured we were trying to do this with a great amount of safety we had a, a professional uh firearms expert who was the shooter and i had gone through this with him for weeks going over all the details we really did an immense amount of, of safety precaution but but still with all the precautions i ended up in the hospital now here's the funniest part of the story so i got to the hospital after having this, this uh, piece of glass injure me. And when I got off of the, uh, the gurney and I'm heading into the hospital, they check you in and they ask, you know, what are you here for? And I said, well, I have an injury. What was the injury caused by? Well, I was just uh, shot at by a gun and I caught the bullet. And the, the doctor is like, you just did what? Wait, wait, what, <laughs> what did you say? I said, well, I, I was performing the bullet catch trick and I caught the bullet, but there was a piece of glass that hit me. He goes, well, back up to the bullet part. You <laughs> caught the bullet? We didn't learn about this in medical school. <laughs> Just the, the idea of performing that trick. Now, I know you did it 
for that television special, and that was important. But where do you go if you decide, I, I'm going to perform a bullet catch? Who do you turn to to say, how, how does this, how do I learn this? There's a great resource called the uh, Conjuring Arts Research Center in New York City. It's run by Bill Kalush, who's a uh, exceptionally talented magician and philanthropist who has put together a library of magic books uh, that date back, I think, to the 15th century and maybe the 16th century. And these books are all scanned into searchable PDFs. So when you're in his library, you can actually find pretty much any secret that's ever been written in not only English, but in other languages too, because he has on staff or had on staff a, uh, a linguist who could help translate books from Spanish and French and Italian, Chinese into English, so that all this information is available. Much of that data has been put into an archive called Ask Alexander. And so I found many instances of the bullet catch uh, through Ask Alexander, and then found how it had been done and how it shouldn't be done. For instance, there is a famous magician, mentalist named Ted Anneman, and Ted Anneman uh, came up with a method for performing the bullet catch, which was really genuinely dangerous. I mean, he mm. could have died uh, performing the trick the way that he had uh, devised it. And it was so risky and so nerve wracking to him that after he set up a performance that was supposed to be given in New York in 42nd Street, this small, this small theater, he actually got so anxious about the upcoming performance of the bullet catch indoors that he committed suicide. He was at his house in Perry Street downtown, and uh, he hooked up a gas pipe to his, his gas stove and stuck his head in the oven and just killed himself with, uh, you know, out of fear of performing this trick, even after having sold the tickets to the show. Yeah. I have one of the original tickets to that show that never took place because he, he killed himself. But the, uh, the bullet catch is, you know, it's something that plays with your mind. I remember talking to other magicians who have performed it, Simon Drake, for example, in, in England. And he said that it, it caused him a great amount of psychological breakdown after having performed it. Um, I remember talking to Dorothy Dietrich, who has performed the bullet catch. And she said she was, a, she was fearful all the time that people would pull guns on her uh, and say, hey, catch this, you know, because that's, that's really where it, 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 what it boils down to. It's if, you prove it, if you've proven that you can catch a bullet, then people think you could do it all the time. Right? right. And and so, you know, if, if someone takes this as a challenge, because we live in a trigger happy world, someone might come up to you and, and at random say, hey, well, you're the magician who catches bullets, catch this. And it could really put you, it could make you feel very neurotic yep. or, you know, kind of always on edge because you're wor wondering when will this next challenge be bestowed upon me. So if a magician approached you and said they wanted to do it, what advice would you offer before they go down that path? Yeah, I, the advice I always give to people who are interested in learning the bullet catch is don't do it. There's many other ways to entertain an audience. And, you know, even if you say I've got the most, the most safest method, I've got uh, all the fail safes are in place. You know, there are other ways to entertain an audience. Um, I now stick to card tricks. <laughs> the worst damage I can get is a paper cut. But, you know, I think at some point you have to stop playing blood sports and uh, just realize that your life is not only your own, but also it's, you belong to, it belongs to your family and, and your loved ones. So, you know, it maybe is for a younger person to, to play games like that because you think you're going to live forever. But, you know, I personally think that there's other ways to entertain an audience. Mm. Actually, and Penn and Teller have a really a great approach towards danger. They say that it's okay to make things look dangerous, but they should never be dangerous. You know, it's okay to give people the thrill, almost like a horror film, that something might actually, it might look or appear to be dangerous, but it should never actually uh, have any element of true danger where the performer, him or herself, can walk away with a, a genuine injury. There's no, there's no need to do that. I think but, you know, part of the artistry is making it look dangerous without it actually being dangerous. One of the... Uh, the areas of, of entertainment is bringing people to the edge of comfort mm -hmm. and then seeing how far you, you, know, you can take them there before you bring them back. And, and um, 
you know, if there's a genuine danger involved, I mean, if you're really going to hurt yourself, I think that you might want to reevaluate that because he probably won't be performing for all for all that long. Yeah, it's it's dangerous. Now, the closest thing you do to something, quote unquote, dangerous, and I suppose it really isn't, although you do have a scar to prove it, is needle through the arm. Yeah, which, uh, you know, is not at all dangerous. It, it uh, I have a scar because I don't do it well, but you can't <laughs> die from from doing the needle through the arm unless I, I guess you could, but it's nowhere in the league of the bullet catch trick. And I I think the the biggest takeaway from his uh, interview for me is there's probably other ways you could entertain an audience. Uh, yeah. there, it just doesn't have to be this. Uh, and I also like the fact that he chatted about Penn and Teller because as we said before the interview, it's it's a terrifying thing to watch when they load those guns and the lasers and they you know track those lasers up their bodies and point them at each other's faces. It's terrifying. But I'm happy to hear, at least from Steve's perspective, that it's okay to make things look dangerous like you would in a film, as long as they aren't really dangerous. And I assume the number of times Penn and Teller have performed that trick, that they must have come up with a method that would not allow any craziness to uh, to happen. Yeah, Most I believe Penn has been quite adamant about the, uh, the immorality of doing something where anyone is actually in danger. If you want to learn a little bit more about uh, the bullet catch we've got uh, on our uh, show notes, there's going to be a link to David Blaine talking about the bullet catch and uh, an, an, an older video of the pen dragons actually performing the bullet catch. I did not know that they did that trick. It's not a trick I would ever want a piece of. I toyed with the idea for a while that it might be a fun thing to do in a show that that I do. And, and then I quickly, I'd gone to a magic convention called the Invocation uh, that Eugene Berger asked me to come to uh, in Chicago. Uh, and it was put on by a guy named Tony Andruzzi, God rest their soul, God rest Eugene's soul. And um, at that conference or magic convention, uh, they had a giveaway and I won a copy of the book, 12 Have Died. And it just so happened that Orville Meyer was also at the uh, convention. And so I, I had him sign this book because he's one of the people that had, you know, uh, performed this thing. Uh, when you think about 12 people have died doing yeah. this, and I think that count is low, frankly, uh, as, as do many. Um, it's, it is a crazy thing to attempt. And I'm, I, I want nothing to do with it, nor should anyone listening to this podcast uh, want anything to do with it. I just, uh, it's crazy. Yeah, it is. And, and that's good background for what Eli is going to be experiencing in this book, the, uh, the, the danger uh, that his friend rightfully feels that he's in, in recreating this trick uh, on a movie set. And we're going to learn about that right now uh, as we jump into chapter two, just to remind us of chapter one of the bullet catch, uh, Eli has uh, developed a sort of uh, crippling uh, panic attacks when he's involved in uh, any heights of any kind, particularly outdoor heights, anything where uh, he could uh, go over an edge somewhere. And he's dealing with uh, Dr. Baki, his therapist on that. And then we go into chapter two uh, in which the story really starts to rev up as a mysterious stranger appears in Chicago magic. This is chapter two. The Bullet Catch, an Eli Marks mystery. Chapter 2 Until the sound of the bell alerted me to the arrival of a customer, I had spent the better part of the next morning fumbling with a deck of cards in my hands, trying, not for the first time, to unlock the secret of the center deal. The center deal is a fabled card move in which the magician deals a selected card not from the top or bottom of the deck, but from the center. It's a slight that it always stymied me, and I take only a small amount of solace in the knowledge that I am far from alone in my inability to master the move. I set the cards down and looked up to see who had come in, expecting to recognize one of the two dozen or so customers who still frequented our brick-and-mortar shop 
as opposed to doing all their magic shopping online. Instead, I was greeted with the image of a complete stranger who also, oddly enough, looked vaguely familiar. He was somewhere in his 30s, and he wore a baseball cap pulled down over his eyes, which were covered with dark, expensive-looking sunglasses. A mop of dirty blonde hair jutted out from under the hat in a random and reckless fashion. He wore a faded Minnesota Twins jersey and even more faded jeans, but the footwear peeking out from beneath his pants cuffs appeared pointed, textured, and rich. Alligator, perhaps, or maybe from a species higher up on the endangered list. If someone had made a pair of boots out of a Komodo dragon, I thought, this is what the result might look like. Is anyone else here? he asked in a hoarse whisper. Depends. I said, calculating how much cash was in the register and which nearby magic prop might best be employed as an impromptu weapon. Eli, it's me, Jake, Jake North. He pulled off his cap, and the dirty blonde mop came with it. The glasses came off next, and it was then I was able to put the name with the face. Jake, what are you doing here, in disguise? I'd heard you were in town. He cut me off, looking around again to double-check for others in the vicinity. It's a small shop, and that didn't take long. Have you got a few minutes to talk? Sure, absolutely. What's going on? Even though we were clearly alone, he still leaned in close and spoke just above a whisper. I need your help, he said. Someone is trying to kill me. Okay, start at the beginning. We had taken a corner table at the coffee shop down the street and settled in with our respective purchases, black coffee for me and a double soy mocha latte grande for Jake. His precise and arcane instructions to the barista had slowed the process considerably, but with his order in hand, he seemed less on edge. He was still in his disguise, which I was convinced was calling more attention to him than if he had just gone with his normal look. But you know actors and their innate ability to add drama to any situation. All right, he said, his voice a soft whisper. So I'm back in town making a flick. I nodded. Sure, I heard something about that. Some low-budget thing, right? Low by Hollywood standards, sure. But it's a real movie, and my agent thinks it could be my ticket out of TV and out of the big screen. Being in films full-time had always been Jake's dream. He and I had met in high school, and although we hadn't traveled in the same circles, our circles did have points of intersection. We're both performers. His path had put him in all the plays at school, while my path put me in all the talent shows. His real break came when he was cast as the lead in a TV series called Blind Man's Bluff, a comedy about a lout who pretends to be blind to impress a girl and then must continue the ruse indefinitely. It hit new lows on the bad taste index, even by cable standards, and was known for its equal servings of disabled jokes, ethnic slurs, and crude sexual puns and picadillos. So, of course, it was a huge hit. Anyway, he continued, sucking some of the foam off the top of his coffee, the movie is a biography of a guy with whom I'm guessing you're at least slightly familiar. Terry Alexander? I nodded, slowly surprised to hear that name after all these years. I certainly knew the name of Terry Alexander. Any magician with a heartbeat was familiar with the life and death of Terry Alexander. Sure, I said, infamously known as the Cloaked Conjurer. Yes, and also infamously known as one of the dozen or so magicians who have died while attempting to perform the bullet catch. In South America somewhere, wasn't it? Peru, I think? Jake shook his head. Ecuador. Toward the end, he was basically doing his act in a traveling circus. Wow. His career certainly took a nosedive. Apparently, that's what happens when you go on national TV and start exposing magic's greatest secrets. He added a dramatic flourish to those last three words. Magic's Greatest Secrets have been a series of television specials in which the Cloak Conjurer revealed the inner workings of some of the best magic illusions of all time. Magicians, of course, 
were outraged at his flagrant disregard for the code of ethics that binds all magicians, the promise to never tell lay people how the trick works. Terry had broken that sacred pledge and had pretty much been blackballed out of the business from that point on. In desperation, he had returned to his traditional magic act and took gigs wherever he could, finally ending up doing a second-rate act in third-world countries. He got work, though, because he was one of the only performers willing to do the bullet catch, Jake continued, and that got him work in those far-flung performance venues. Until someone killed him. Yes, until someone killed him while he was doing the bullet catch. Jake had a distant look in his eyes. I tried to pull him back. And you play Terry? Yes, he said, snapping back into the conversation. It's a challenging role. The script is lousy, so we're diverging from it at every point possible. But I think in the end, I will have created a fully rounded character with layers of depth. He took a big gulp of what I was sure was still pretty hot coffee, but he showed no reaction to it. But what's got me more concerned, much more concerned, is that I'll have to do the bullet catch. But it's a movie, I said. I mean, you don't have to do it for real, right? They have stunt guys and CGI and editing tricks. I know, I know, he said with no real conviction. But I just have this gut feeling... His voice trailed off. I wasn't sure what to say to help him out. Certainly they've got experts working with you on this, I finally offered. Oh, yeah, he said quietly. I trained with some of the top magicians in L.A. for six months. I can do Terry Alexander's whole act start to finish. So why are you so concerned about this one part of the act? Right now, this flick is just a blip on Hollywood's radar. A little indie about a famous unsolved crime. But, he said with a mix of anticipation and dread, if I actually died while doing the bullet catch... Yeah. I didn't like where this was heading. Then it will be a hit. A monster hit. You've developed some real chops, I said, genuinely impressed. Our coffee was cold, and I had steered the discussion away from Jake's fear of dying and asked him how he was doing the rest of the magic in the movie. The producers found some guys at the Magic Castle in L.A., he said, casually dropping the names of three well-regarded magicians. Training from any one of them would have produced outstanding results, and I was curious to see what he had learned from this trio of masters. I handed him the deck of cards I always carry and asked for a demonstration. Jake took the deck tentatively at first, then executed some nearly flawless moves. A slick top change, a false shuffle I hadn't seen before, and some flashy card flourishes that skirted the sometimes thin line between magic and juggling. His work was impressive, and he was clearly well-trained, but it was all done by rote. He lacked the craft to be able to deviate and improvise. However, he handled the cards well and comfortably, and for those moments, I believed he might actually bring Terry Alexander to life on screen. If he didn't die trying. So, what makes you think your life is in danger? Well, it was small things at first, he said quietly. Like when I found out they weren't working with my L.A. trainers on the bullet catch. Those guys know their stuff. But the director said he had another resource in Las Vegas. Turns out the guy the director got is just a buddy of his from college. He runs a shooting range, but has no real training in this. But the thing that really unnerved me was when I saw the shooting schedule. They had scheduled the filming of the bullet catch scene last. Dead last. Is it the last scene in the movie? Yes and no. It's all told as a flashback from the moment the bullet is fired from the gun. That might change in the editing, who knows, but these things are hardly ever shot in order. And that's the very last scene I'm going to shoot. Last day, last scene, last shot. A coincidence? Maybe. But then I was at the director's house in California doing a read-through of the script with some of the cast, and I noticed a DVD box on the TV. He had been watching The Crow. I shrugged. 
I'm missing the connection. The actor. Brandon Lee died while making The Crow. He was shot when a prop gun misfired. It was tragic, but it didn't hurt the film one bit. Some people say it helped to make it a hit. And you think the same thing could happen here? Hey, if your job was to sell a movie about Terry Alexander, you'd probably have a pretty tough time of it. Sure, it's an unsolved mystery who killed Terry Alexander, but the downside is there's no stars, no pre-sale name value to the property, it's low budget and under the radar. But if the lead actor gets shot and killed while in the process of recreating the scene where the main character got shot and killed, his voice trailed off and then he added, that's a film people are going to want to see. Hell, if I weren't dead, I'd want to see it. We crossed the street and stood on the corner across from the coffee shop, quietly assessing each other. So, what can I do to help? I finally asked. Jake nodded, considering his words. I'd love to bring you on as my personal magic coach on the set. There's money in the budget, and Lord knows I could use the help, particularly when we shoot the bullet catch. I can do that. Might be fun. Jake smiled grimly. Yeah, film sets are a nonstop riot. He took off his sunglasses and rubbed his eyes. We finished the bulk of interiors in Vancouver where they recreated Terry's early years and the TV specials. We're in Minneapolis mostly to do the Ecuador scenes, the traveling circus. Minneapolis is their choice to recreate rural Ecuador? Jake chuckled. Hollywood magic. They're redressing the Renaissance Festival grounds outside of town to look like an Ecuadorian village. It was cheaper than going to South America, and Minnesota finally put in some tax breaks for filmmakers. It's economics. In Hollywood, it's always economics. We were standing in front of Chi and Things, the store on the corner of the block that includes Chicago Magic. We stepped aside to let some customers pass, and I stole a peek into the shop through the open door, hoping to catch a glimpse of Megan. I thought I saw a hint of her curly brown hair in the back of the store, but whoever it was disappeared out of sight behind some shelves. I hadn't been in the store, her store, since the breakup, and the few sightings I'd had of her had been way too distant and far too brief. But we both worked on the same block, and the odds were at some point or another our paths would have to cross. I wasn't sure how I would react when we finally did bump into each other, but that didn't make me want it any less. Somewhere in my brain, I was convinced that just the sight of me would be enough for her to throw back her head, give a coquettish laugh, and say, Eli, Eli, what was I thinking? before throwing herself into my arms. What? I asked, realizing that Jake had said something. I said you don't have to decide right now about being my magic coach. We can talk about it at the reunion. I turned back, not sure what he meant. The reunion, I repeated. Yeah, our 15th high school reunion this weekend. You're going, right? I mean, come on. He gave my arm a playful punch. Two successful single guys like us will rock the place. I don't know, I said, slowly shaking my head. I went to the 10th reunion, and it was really sort of a drag. And anyway... I didn't see you there, I added accusingly. Nah, I skipped the tenth. I hadn't attained my reunion goal at that point. Your reunion goal? He smiled a wicked grin. I swore I wasn't coming back to a reunion until I knew for sure no one would have to ask what I was up to. Because I would be so famous they would already know, and I think I hit my goal this year with Bluff. I had to agree he was probably right. Two more customers stepped past us to get into Chi and things. I held the door for them, using it as an excuse to once again scan the store for Megan. And that's when I realized she wasn't in the store. She was one of the two women going into the store, and I was holding the door for her. Megan was clearly as lost in thought as I was. She turned to thank me for holding the door, then stopped cold, realizing who I was. Her companion turned, and I recognized her elderly friend, Franny, who recognized me right back. 
Eli, good to see you, Franny said, breaking into a wide grin. Holding the door like a polite doorman, that uncle of yours raised you well, I see. She turned to Megan and then, seeing the stricken look on her face, turned back. Oh, I forgot. You two are on a break. Well, this is awkward. Very awkward. Franny chuckled as she looked from Megan to me and then back to Megan, clearly enjoying the small drama she had stepped into. She glanced over at Jake. And who is this tall drink of water with the dish mop on his head? I'd actually forgotten for a moment he was standing there. Oh, this is Jake, I gestured to the two women. Jake, this is Franny and Megan. Megan nodded at Jake and then turned to me, looking me in the eye for the first time. Hi, Eli, Megan finally said, her voice just barely above a whisper. Hi. Hello. My voice didn't do much better. I'm surprised we didn't see this coming, Franny said with a laugh. No one else joined in. Franny and Megan are psychics, I said to Jake by way of explanation. I understand, he said, without a note of skepticism. I live in L.A. A pause. I sifted quickly through my thoughts, trying to find the most appropriate comment and coming up short. So how's that Uncle Harry of yours? Franny interjected, seemingly ignoring the tension that had formed within the small group. Megan looked at me again. I returned her gaze, trying not to look too intense. Nonchalance was a hard nut to crack with so little warning. I turned to Franny. He's good. Still cranky, but good. Nice to hear. Tell him Franny said, hey. I will, I will. Our conversation gap started to get wider and wider, moving quickly from a small fissure to Grand Canyon-style gaping hole. None of us knew how to close it. Megan finally took action. Well, she said to Jake, nice to meet you. She shook his hand and then turned to me. Good to see you, Eli. Megan moved in for a handshake, which I misread as an impending hug. The resultant body mash was a messy mix-up of both. She then disappeared into the store. I held onto the door handle, not quite ready to let it go. Franny lingered behind, clearly waiting until Megan was out of earshot. I'm glad I ran into you, Eli, she said with sudden seriousness. I had a ping about you this morning, out of the blue. I don't often get those, but when I do, I've learned to listen to them. Franny makes her living as a phone psychic, literally. That is, she only gathers insights while on the phone. No standard in-person, one-on-one live readings for her. It's on the phone or nothing. And she really runs it like a business, putting in banker's hours and turning off the phone on evenings and weekends. As she likes to say, I leave work at work. I nodded, waiting for her to continue. I saw a gun and a bullet, she said quietly. A man gets shot. Somehow, you are involved. And this was the weird part. The man who got shot was the man who got shot, but he wasn't. It didn't make any sense to me. I hope it makes sense to you. She patted my arm warmly and then disappeared into the store. I released my grip on the door handle and the door swung slowly shut. I turned back to Jake. I have to admit... I wasn't particularly surprised to see that his face had gone completely pale. And that's our friend Franny giving a little prediction there about what might be happening to some person with a gun. Uh, I think, as I mentioned uh, in the last episode of the episode before that, Franny was not supposed to survive the, the first book, The Ambitious Card but was such a fun character that uh, she did survive. And I'm glad she's uh, around for this one because her prediction, uh, as with many of Franny's predictions, proves to be both uh, uh, right and wrong. Yeah, at the same time, which is uh, the danger of predictions, I guess. Uh, Unless you do it professionally, in which case it's always right. It is always right, yeah. Or the stuff you remember is right and you can forget the rest. So in this... Let me ask, can I, can yeah. I sidebar for just a minute to ask you a question? You so this, uh, you know, sometimes authors create out of whole stock, uh, you know, a complete fictional 
Uh, and then sometimes, you know, you write what you know. So do you have, uh, I don't even know this. I'm asking you an honest question. Do you have a fear of heights or do you, have you experienced <clears throat> panic attacks? I, exactly what Eli is going through, uh, I was experiencing at that time. It came out of nowhere. I'd, I'd always had a, what you would call a, you know, a reasonable fear of, uh, you know, I don't, I'd rather not go up into that high place, but I can certainly do it. Yeah. Um, and something just clicked. Uh, and as we learned from Dennis Plumbo last episode, uh, a lot of times stress in your life, it comes out that way, which is what's happening with Eli. And I all of a sudden couldn't uh, uh, walk across a bridge. It's not going to happen. I had trouble driving across bridges. And it was terrifying in and of itself, uh, to quote a famous magic show, but also unnerving just because it came out of nowhere. There was no precedent for it. And then all of a sudden, boom, I had this problem. And it was related to uh, work-related stress, I'm sure, because yeah. things were not particularly great at that point uh, in the economy, which had an impact on meetings and events. Uh, and it, it is still, uh, I still get an occasional, you know, if I'm watching TV and someone's hanging off the edge of a building, the, the legs go a little rubbery. But as Eli finds out, and as I found out, the whole thing is not that uncommon. People have that sort of fear there's a lot of people out there that have that sort of fear. And uh, as uh, Dennis Palumbo recommended in the case of, uh, of a client who had a deadly fear of spiders, uh, he said, if your son's baseball goes under the house and you need to crawl under there to get it, uh, buy a new baseball. Yeah. And that was sort of the advice I got from the real life equivalent of Dr. Baki, which was, this will work out. But for the time being, the best thing to do is just, you know, don't go... To the top of the Fauché Tower and go stand out on the edge and look out. Yeah. It's not going to make you happy. And I don't even know if you can still do that in the Fauché Tower. And I'm certainly dating myself when I say that was the tallest building in the Twin Cities. And for 25 cents, you could go up to the top and be, hey, look, I can see Lake Harriet from here. It was yeah. pretty exciting. Do you, uh, so, but right, for the most part, you're through it and it doesn't, I mean, you can cross a bridge now or? Yes, I can cross a bridge now without an issue. I wouldn't go to one of those glass bottom bridge things across a big chasm. Well, nobody would, John. Well, there, there are people who do it and I could have done it before, but yeah, I'm mostly normal, which I think I should probably put on my business card. <laughs> John Gaspard, mostly normal since mostly. 1958. Yeah, there mostly normal. Yeah. It's very nice. It, uh, I, I, um, I, I'm fascinated by the whole topic because, of course, the idea that something could come out of nowhere and suddenly uh, destabilize uh, an otherwise mostly normal life yeah. is interesting and terrifying at the same time. And it wasn't that difficult to put Eli in situations where he had to deal with it. You don't really have to go out of your way, really, uh, in real life, particularly if you're a magician doing events going from place to place. Right. And as we'll find later in the book, he has uh, a, quite a problem with a hotel in down to Minneapolis, a hotel which, surprisingly, turns up again in the zombie ball, which is a flashback book, um, in which you learn more about that hotel and Eli's history with it. But anyway, uh, in this chapter, we got to meet his friend Jake North, who's a TV actor, mm -hmm. and uh, they talk about Terry Alexander, the cloaked conjurer who gave away magic secrets on TV, uh, and he's obviously based on uh, Val Valentino, who as the masked magician uh, had a number of TV specials in which the secrets behind magic tricks were revealed, not always correctly, but enough so that it, uh, it certainly annoyed the magic community. I was not interested that much in magic at the time, but I certainly heard about it and saw it and uh, understood the, um, the anger. Do you remember those specials? Yeah, absolutely. I remember the specials. I can say I never watched one of those specials, but I remember the, because I was always, have always been on the sort of magical fringe. Uh, and so, I, yes, of course, I remember all of that stuff. And I think, you know, the long and short of it is there been that kind of stuff from the gate, I would think. People were exposing and exposing and exposing right right from the beginning of magic. Somebody would uh, create some sort of uh, explanation for the cups and balls and put it in print and circulate it. And it really did not. Good magic is good magic. And even if you know what's going on, uh, it's still good magic. And so I, I, that whole thing, I, I get why people were upset, but uh, it was, I think in hindsight, maybe we shouldn't have given him 
the megaphone that we gave him as magicians to say, don't watch that. Don't why he's there. It's terrible. Don't don't it's it's hurting us. There is now a name for that. It's called the Streisand effect. I don't know if you know of what's it's the beginnings of that, but apparently someone someone posted Barbara Streisand's address and she went on the internet and said, do not look at this link because it tells you my address. So everybody looked at it. Um, but that's a mistake. Well, that's the mistake. Yeah. Uh, and it's called the Streisand effect, where if you just shut up, it's going to go away. Yeah, there, especially today, where, you know, the news cycle is not a day. It's done in minutes now. Yeah. We get uh, updates so quickly that if uh, a story would have to be immense for us to have any kind of uh, focus on it for longer than uh, it takes for the next Twitter to uh, tweet. <laughs> Yes, but at the time of the Mass Magician, the news cycle was a little slower, and we were very fortunate to have a chat with a guy who was kind of in the midst of it, um, and he'll be with us on our next episode. That's Stan Allen, who uh, was publisher of Magic Magazine and is the producer of uh, Magic Live, one of the biggest uh, magic conventions in the world. Uh, and he, as the publisher of Magic Magazine, was sort of in the thick of it. He knew Val, he asked Val the, the right questions and he just didn't get, uh, even though he knew what the answers were, uh, he got sort of shady answers. So anyway, Stan is a funny and, and fascinating man. Uh, I got to see him perform live at uh, one of the Genie conventions uh, and you just forget what a, uh, uh, you know, you, you know him as a magazine publisher and you forget he's a, you know, magician with a million years experience yeah. uh, and is very, very funny. And uh, we had a great conversation talking about uh, magic and the mass magician and secrets. Hey, that's that, coming up next episode. That is. And then in keeping with uh, the idea that the bullet catch is a, is a dangerous trick uh, in two episodes, we're going to chat with Joshua J who uh -huh. will talk to us about a presentation he gives called tragic magic, which are, uh, stories of magicians who've been injured or killed while performing well that's fun huh that's <laughs> yeah. fun 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 yes i i i guess we're going down kind of a grim path for the first uh well, next grim. couple episodes but it's then things things will lighten up quite a bit although both those episodes are quite funny uh stan in particular is a delight but after that we've got guests like kayla drescher pat hazel john armstrong jonathan levitt and your favorite harrison greenbaum harrison greenbaum but all of them were fun. I'm, I'm learning something in absolutely every single interview that we do that I can apply to the real world. Dennis Palumbo, don't assign meaning to things. Uh, this, find a different way to entertain the audience than making your <laughs> life. That's, yes. that's a good one. I'm writing that one down. Oh, yeah. That, that's, we're all about the learning here at Behind the Page Eli Marks podcast. Yeah. Anyway, as, uh, as I mentioned earlier in the show notes, we've got video of David Blaine talking about the bullet catch. We've got the Pendragons performing the bullet catch. If you haven't seen the Pendragons perform, what is the name of their? Metamorphosis. If you, have, if you haven't seen the Pendragons performing Metamorphosis, boy, I think if I can find a link, I'll put that up there. That was, I wore out that video. Uh, yeah, it's it's really something. That's a Houdini trick. I mean, and it may predate Houdini, in fact, but uh, Houdini sort of made it gave the fame and the Pendragons really perfected it in their hands. It is a complete, even if you know what's going on, it's yeah. so good. Uh, it's it's great. So yeah, we, I, we can find that. We should put that up. I will put that up. I won't put up the video that I bought of him uh, uh, training how to do it, showing us how to do it. And I will tell you that the, the camera shot from the back is just as fascinating as the, the trick the audience is seeing. What is happening behind the foulard, we learned the word foulard when we're recording the audiobooks, is just as amazing. Seeing it, seeing how it's done is just as amazing as, as seeing it as a, as a mystery. Magic, when it is good, is one of the greatest art forms known to man. When it is good, magic can absolutely rock your world. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Well, if you enjoyed what you listened to so far, we've got some really nice reviews. I get, I get these emails from the different services saying, hey, somebody left this review. Um, and people seem to be uh, liking what we're doing here. So if you do like us, you don't have to write a whole review. Just follow the link in the show notes to Apple Podcasts and just click uh, the number of stars. Mm -hmm. That alone will help get us out to people who might not otherwise have heard of us, but who might enjoy listening 
to our silly banter and our great interviews and the occasional audiobook. The joy of this for me continues, not just in our uh, uh, luck and fortune in uh, not only working together, but also getting a chance to interview some astoundingly great magicians. Uh, but I got a nice uh, note from my friend Russ this week who said he uh, is about uh, three quarters of the way through episode one, and he is uh, loving every minute of it and enjoying the, the sort of backstage inside magic uh, thing that's going on here, even though he's not really a magician. He's fascinated by the whole deal. And uh, he said to me, as soon as I'm done, I'm gonna just download the audio book and listen to that uninterrupted so that I can get the flow. But uh, so it, it, it's, in addition to the fun we're having, I'm, I'm also enjoying hearing from friends who are enjoying what's going on. And we're making new friends as well. Yeah. Anyway, that's it for this episode. We'll see you uh, next time for episode 203, where we'll listen to chapter three of the bullet catch and talk to the always uh, charming uh, Mr. Stan Allen. See you later, everybody. Take care. Bye bye. <laughs> This has been Behind the Page, the Eli Marks podcast with your hosts, John Gaspard and Jim Cunningham, produced by Albert's Bridge Books at Grass Lake Studios. Find this podcast and all the books in the Eli Marks series at elimarksmysteries.com. That's E-L-I-M-A-R-K-S, mysteries.com. And thanks for listening. Thank you.